ADD and ADHD are a set of symptoms that are challenging for the person who has them, but also for the parents and those around them. Also a challenge is the same set of symptoms for ADD and ADHD are also symptoms for many other issues that can be difficult to diagnose. This presentation is meant to help parents and professionals identify if those symptoms are ADD, ADHD, or something else. We will talk about who to go to for help with each issue, how ADD, ADHD medications work, and parenting support skills that can be used with children with all the different types of issues, but especially help those with ADD and ADHD symptoms. First, it's important to understand the symptoms of ADD and ADHD. Attention, easily distracted, missing details, frequently switching from one activity to another, daydreaming, becoming easily confused, having difficulty processing information as quickly and as accurately as others. Distracted, difficulty focusing on one thing at a time. Impatient, becomes bored with a task after only a few minutes, unless they're doing something enjoyable, have difficulty waiting for things they want or waiting their turns in games, often interrupting conversations of others and activities. Impulsivity, blurt out inappropriate comments, show their emotions without restraint, and act without regard for consequences. Not listening when spoken to, fidgeting, fidget and squirm in their seats, having trouble sitting still during dinner, school, and story time, have difficulty doing quiet tasks or activities, losing things, having trouble completing or turning in homework assignments, often losing things like pencils, toys, or assignments that are needed to complete tasks or activities. Trouble organizing, having difficulty focusing attention on organizing and completing a task or learning something new. For example, trying to explain something to the child that they asked about and struggling to follow instructions. On the go or motor, non-stop, dashing around, touching or playing with anything and everything in sight, constantly in motion. Inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity are key behaviors of ADHD. It is normal for all children to be inattentive, hyperactive, or impulsive sometimes, but for children with ADHD, these behaviors are more severe and occur more often. ADHD does not have a sudden onset like right after a move or starting a new school. While it might seem contrary to our typical belief about ADD, a child who suffers with attention deficit disorder has a brain that is actually kind of tired kind of sluggish, not actually working up to the speed that yours or mine might be working. You may be aware that most of the medication for children who suffer with ADD are actually stimulants. This works for many children because it wakes up the brain. It gets it moving at a speed where they can function better in school or wherever. You may also see moodiness, anger, low self-esteem and low self-confidence. These could be signs of other issues as well. Vision. Current research shows that about 20% of school-aged children have undetected vision problems which are hindering their school performance. Many of these children have passed their school's vision screening, which is only designed to check children's distance as measured by the 2020 line on an eye chart. Unfortunately, school screenings don't check to see if children can coordinate both eyes as a team, track print across a written page without losing their place, or comfortably focus when looking from near to far away. Children can have 20-20 eyesight, meaning normal distance vision, and still have vision problems in other areas. Symptoms of this include headaches, reading below grade level, losing place while reading, head tilting or closes an eye when reading. Hard to copy from the board, doesn't like reading or writing, leaves out small words when reading, burning, itching, or watery eyes, issues understanding what they've read, holding the book very close, attention issues when reading, hard to finish assignments on time, gives up easily or saying I can't before trying, bumps into things, knocks things over, homework takes too long, frequently daydreaming, trouble being off task. Hearing issues. Um, this can also look like inattentive behavior and learning issues. 
Also, there's a hearing issue called auditory processing disorder. It's considered a dyslexia for hearing. It includes a difficulty with direction of sound and confusing similar sounding words. The characteristics are difficulty paying attention and remembering information that's presented orally, issues with multi-step directions given orally, and a need to hear only one direction at a time, poor listening skills, needing more time to process information, low academic performance, behavior problems, language difficulties like confusing syllable sequence, and having problems developing vocabulary, difficulty with reading, comprehension, spelling, and vocabulary. Foods and sugar. A study in 2007 showed a link between food additives like artificial colors and preservatives and an increase in activity. This is being investigated now. Most foods geared toward children contain these ingredients, including Pop-Tarts, Cocoa Puffs, and Cheetos. If it has a cartoon character on it, check the ingredients. Sugar is controversial as some studies show it has effect and some don't. In her book titled Little Sugar Addicts and the Mood Swings, Meltdowns, Tantrums, Low Self-Esteem in Your Child Today, Dr. Demaison suggests looking at your child's behavior, health, and emotional state. A quote from her book, she says, Does your child ask for sweet foods all the time? Have unexpected meltdowns that end in tantrums or tears? Is she impulsive, wildly dramatic, or goofy, restless, or known as a motor mouth? Does she have a hard time paying attention or lock in on a task and then forget to do anything else? Look at your child's health too. Does she have a lot of allergies or persistent ear infections? Is she overweight? And what is her general mood? Does she cry easily and frequently? Is she moody or does she exhibit low self-esteem? The most critical issue for children is when their blood sugar drops. De Maison continues and points out, if your child is being horrible and you give them something sweet and they're immediately nice, then they are sugar sensitive. Allergies. Certain types of allergies can also have these symptoms. Studies have revealed a strong connection between the increasing cases of ADHD and allergy to food dyes. Avoid foods containing color dyes like yellow 6, red 40, and blue 1. You can find these things in vitamins, juices, lipsticks, toothpastes. They contain artificial flavors, colors, and other additives that can worsen the symptoms of ADHD. Lead. Lead paint and other lead exposure can manifest symptoms very similar to ADD and ADHD. If you have a house that was built before 1978, there is a chance that there is lead in the paint. Older plumbing fixtures and older houses and buildings, older children's toys may also contain lead. If you believe your child may have been exposed to lead, you will want to ask your primary care physician or pediatrician about looking at levels of lead in your child. It's a simple blood test. Sleep. Sleep deprivation or not enough sleep can certainly have these symptoms. Um, it could be that there's a new baby in the house or sharing a bedroom with a sibling that is waking them up frequently during the night, a new location and waking up from a train outside or new noises, also going to bed too late. Kiddos need 10 to 12 hours of sleep per night. Learning disability. A child having learning disabilities will have trouble understanding the lessons, perform poorly, and appear to have attention issues, trouble listening, and may become impatient, fidgety, etc., and look like ADD, ADHD symptoms. Gifted. This is a case where the child learns very, very quickly. They pick up on things fast and the regular pace of a classroom is just not challenging. In this case, they're gonna appear bored, they may appear distracted, fidgeting, impatient, not caring about assignments and losing them. If the assignment is so under their level, then it's not gonna be challenging and it's gonna feel like busy work and the motivation to do the assignment and complete it is gonna be very, very difficult for them. Now there are other issues that also share ADD, ADHD symptoms, and they often include nightmares, fears, cramps, tummy aches, and headaches. Anxiety. There are many causes of anxiety for children, and that includes any change like moving 
or someone moving in or out of the house, a new school, a parent or caregiver starting a new job or having an hours change. Some symptoms include fear or worry, fatigue, poor concentration, irritability, sleep disruption, and restlessness in addition to the other ADD and ADHD symptoms. Depression in children and adolescents looks different than depression in adults. Mostly you're going to see inattention issues. You may also see the kid falling behind, losing things, frustrated and irritable, distracted, daydreaming or not listening. These things are also going to be compared to ADD and ADHD, a sudden onset. So they were doing fine in school last year and then all of a sudden they start to slip behind. Depression and anxiety are both things that you want to consider in this case. Grieving. If there is a loss to the child with anyone that was close to them, including animals, then the child can very well go through grieving and they're going to have the same symptoms as with depression and with ADD and ADHD. Trauma. Something scary to the child. Some children are very sensitive. It could be a car accident or seeing a parent very sick. Some symptoms are going to be the same as depression and anxiety. Domestic violence. Even without physical violence, just hearing, arguing, or fighting, or seeing one parent struggling can manifest as symptoms of ADD and ADHD, as well as symptoms of depression and anxiety. Children are very, very sensitive to listening to arguing and fighting in the home. So if you notice these symptoms of ADD and ADHD, and you think it may be one of these other things, or you wanna try and differentiate, then you're gonna to wanna to go to a professional to have them look specifically for those other things. Primary care. You wanna to go to your primary care physician or a pediatrician to rule out these other issues. If you suspect any one in particular, then you're gonna to wanna to ask about it specifically. These are foods and sugars, hearing issues, allergies, vision issues, and possibly lead poisoning. School. You're going to want to ask your school specifically about looking at learning disability or the possibility of giftedness. Behavioral health. You're going to want to seek out behavioral health or a therapist to rule out these other areas. If you suspect one in particular, then you're going to want to bring it up and tell the clinician to look at that area and share any details that you think may be helpful. The therapist will ask many questions to try to rule out these different areas. They may ask for surveys for parents and teachers to fill out or testing to look for specific symptoms. A common reaction to a child who's having symptoms of ADD and ADHD, if it's any of those different diagnoses, is, but why? Why my kid? And so it's my fault? And the answer is, all kids are different. Every person is different. Siblings react differently. Two kids could be exposed to the exact same thing but have two totally different reactions. Not every child that survived Hurricane Katrina had anxiety symptoms during the aftermath. Not every soldier who sees combat has PTSD symptoms. Every person is different. So now what? All the issues on the previous page have one thing in common. They share the symptoms, and those symptoms make it difficult for the child to be in the world and also for those around them, including parents. Current studies indicate that drugs, parenting and behavioral techniques, EEG treatments, yoga, and meditation can be effective in reducing symptoms of ADD and ADHD. Neurofeedback, or EEG training, works at training the brain to be in better balance. When we use neurofeedback to train children with attention deficit disorder, we work on and focus on helping the brain to produce more brain waves that are associated with focus and attention, and we also help them to reduce the volume of brain waves that we associate with sleepiness and tiredness. If this is done successfully, then we can expect to see a reduction in ADD and ADHD symptoms. 
It's a treatment in which the patient sits in front of a computer that is monitoring their brain activity. It doesn't hurt. So they're hooked up with basically a sticker on different areas of their head and it sends information to the computer that monitors their brain patterns. When the brain pattern gets closer to the goal, something on the screen indicates it and encourages the child to continue to function in that way. We use interactive games to engage the child and hold their attention. They range from fighter pilot to a juggler to a roller coaster ride. So in the example of the roller coaster ride, instinctively the child is going to want to see the roller coaster move and speed faster and faster, which it will as the brain gets closer to the goal state. The more they practice, the better they get, and the more the brain learns a different way of functioning. Training typically is done in 30 to 45 minute sessions, two to three times a week for several weeks. It can be difficult to find a practitioner who offers it, and some insurance co companies do not cover it. Also, treatments include yoga and meditation. They've been shown to decrease symptoms of ADD and ADHD. There are many CDs and DVDs available, some free on YouTube, and there are many public libraries that stock these materials as well. Some videos are geared specifically towards children or specifically towards adolescents or teens. All drugs for ADD, ADHD symptoms work on the brain. Most are pills. Some are patches that stick on the skin and are absorbed into the body. Both types of medication work their way into the blood and then to the brain. This is a picture of a close-up image of one of your brain cells. There are billions of these in the brain and each one reaches out to several others. They all talk to each other by sending chemical messages to each other. So this image is of one brain cell reaching out to others. So this image is of what one of the ends of those arms looks like. The cells don't actually touch each other, but they have long arms that come very close to each other and have a gap in between. The cells talk to each other by sending messages. The messages are actually chemicals. This is a picture of two cells really close up and the gap in between them. The messages are those small little tiny dots of light. So one side is passing the chemical messages to the other side. One cell sends the chemical messages. The messages float around between the gap and the receiver side waits for the chemical messages to just float on over to it. The brain is not wasteful of even one of those chemical messages. If the chemical message doesn't drift over to the other cell and be received, then it goes and returns home to the sender. They uptake back to the sender so they can eventually be spit out later in time. So the goal of ADD and ADHD medications is to increase the chemical messages received. So that side that's the receiver end we want more messages to make it over there. So there are two types of stimulant medications. The first type is to turn up the faucet a lot and to slow the reuptake just a little. The idea here is to have the sender create and pump out lots more chemical messages, so lots more of those little dots. They also slow the uptake just a little bit so that the chemical messages float around longer. These type of drugs are amphetamines. Examples of amphetamines are Dexedrin, Adderall, Desoxin, and Vyvanse. The second type of stimulant medication is to turn up the faucet just a little bit and slow the reuptake a lot. The idea here is that the longer that something floats around, the more likely it will reach the other cell. So increase the dots just a little bit, but let them float around a lot longer. These drugs are types of methylphenidate. Examples of methylphenidate are Ritalin, Metadate, Concerta, Quivalent, Daytrona, and Focalin. 
The third type are non-stimulants. They work on slowing the reuptake only. Examples are Stratera, Intervive, and Copve. If you have a family history of mood disorders or your child is not responding to stimulants, non-stimulants may be an option. So the next question is, why do we want to increase these messages? Well, studies show that stimulants increase brain activities in areas that are important for executive functioning. More message means more activity. More activity means we see less ADD and ADHD symptoms. Research also shows an increase in perceived reward. An increase in perceived reward and to be motivated by that reward to do actions. So this tackles the motivation issue of doing things that are not interesting. So stimulants increase the amount of norepinephrine and dopamine. These are the messages that were between the cells, those little white spots. What it causes is an increase in blood pressure and heart rate, constricts blood vessels, increases blood glucose, and increases breathing. It feels like the uh, more alert, more energy, and more attention, and a sense of euphoria. There's also some side effects, restlessness, tremor, anxiety, nervousness, headaches, dizziness, insomnia, dry mouth, unpleasant taste in the mouth, diarrhea or constipation, impotence, changes in sex drive, nausea, vomiting, increased blood pressure, tics, drowsiness, and there's also a potential for cardiovascular failure or heart attacks or lethal seizures, rarely hallucinations and hives as well. So remember, some side effects go away in four weeks or so. A lot of side effects aren't experienced by everybody. Some side effects are helped by the time of day and the dosage. Your doctor can help you with these things as well, and will be monitoring. Studies have shown that some children on these medications do not grow as tall as they might be expected to grow. It is speculated that this could be the result of the side effect of decreased appetite, that maybe the children aren't growing as tall because they didn't eat as much. So watch out for loss of appetite and make sure your child is eating as much as they did before. These drugs are considered to be safe, but it's difficult to have long-term studies that show what keeping your heart at higher blood pressure through childhood does or what it does to the brain because of different environments, homes, diets, genetics, dosage, frequency taken, etc. It's difficult to say what the long-term effects are. Maybe there are lo no long-term effects. Studies do suggest, though, that taking a stimulant does not increase the risk of becoming addicted to stimulants or cocaine as an adult. How to handle the kids. These are different behavioral techniques that can be used on children with no issues or with any issues. Um, definitely all of the ones that were mentioned earlier in the, in the show, but um, they they certainly have been shown to help with children that have symptoms of ADHD. So the first one is empathy. Acknowledging that your kid is not a bad kid or trying to test your patience or push your buttons or be annoying or be embarrassing. Understand instead that they're having a hard time and struggling. It's difficult to have issues with planning ahead, organizing, controlling impulses and completing tasks. You will need to provide extra guidance while your child gradually acquires these skills. Whatever the issue is, they're going through a hard time and they need support. Positive attitude. Don't sweat the small stuff. If you're a perfectionist, you will be disappointed often and expect more from your child than they may be capable of right now. Support. Your child needs your help. They are struggling and they can't simply apply themselves and do better or pay attention and symptoms just go away. Increase self-esteem and self-worth. The key to this is finding challenging activities that they can do well and improve in. Sports, being part of a team are excellent for this. Short-term goals and rewards. Attention problems make it difficult to stay focused on a long-term goal like something a month away. 
People with attention issues crave instant gratification, immediate rewards like what happens in video games. Delayed gratification can be very challenging. This is something that has to be learned. So if you do well, then we will do X on Saturday. Or when you finish this assignment, then you get to go do X. Maybe too far away. Short attainable goals are recommended. So instead, if you do well on this, um, on say 10 minutes of this homework assignment that's difficult, then you can have a few minutes of break and then go back to the difficult things. So they only have to work on trying to sustain for a small period of time. And then after they acquire that and they're doing well at it, then increase it. So if you start out with 10 minutes of a difficult math homework and they start doing well at 10 minutes with a few minutes break and then another 10 minutes and a few minutes break, then increase it to say 12 to 15 minutes and then slowly make it longer. So they're learning the delayed gratification. A token system. Token systems can be very, very helpful and a great incentive program. It's strengthening delayed gratification. So you give a token for good behavior or when you see a behavior that you like. For example, finish three math problems and get a token. A token can be a piece of paper, a marble, a poker chip, or whatever. Then in so many tokens, you get a 10 minute break. You have to gauge your child and what is reasonable and too big of a challenge and what rewards work for them. Start by figuring out what behavior you want to curb or improve. Maybe the child fights with his siblings or home life is a mess. Then give a token whenever you see sharing or behavior that you want to see more of. Have some rewards that they can trade tokens in for. So like a reward menu. Maybe that's a minute of video game time or a favorite show or a special place they want to go on the weekends or games. Your goal is to increase the delayed gratification. So working towards something, they have an option that is farther into the future too. If you were paid once every six months, you would probably have a problem going to work every day. Most people can't tolerate getting paid once a month. Um, once every other week is adequate, um, but people that are paid once a week, they even feel more incentive to not miss a day of work because it's going to show up very soon, these type of things. That's the way that a token system is, is works. works. Uh, praise. Remember, kids with any of the issues that were in that oval circle, they come to expect criticism. So look for the good behavior and reward it with verbal praise or maybe even tokens. Routines. This cannot be emphasized enough. Children, adolescents, and even adults thrive on routines. Think about it. If you went to work and your lunch was at a different time every day, sometimes at noon, sometimes at 1.30 or 2, then it would be anxiety provoking. Uh, knowing what to expect when it's going to happen is, is very comforting. It offers stability and can lower anxiety. So they want you want them to know what to expect next and give them that sense of security. So morning routine, you wake, you eat, you get dressed, eating at the same time every day during the day, a nighttime routine, bath, brush teeth, books, and bed, whatever it is that works for your family and your culture. Keep the same routine every day from the wake up time and then also a bedtime. And uh, you want to include time for homework, outdoor play, indoor activities. You can keep a schedule on the refrigerator or a bulletin board in the kitchen. Write changes in the schedule as far in advance as possible so they know what to expect. Organization. Everything has a home. Have a place for everything. Shoes go here. Backpack goes here. Make folders for different subjects. For all ages, this is essential, especially for adults and teens. This may be one folder for each subject and a special place for finished homework for them to turn in. A common issue is not turning in work even if it is completed. Many teachers put a box on their desk and the students are supposed to come into class and put their homework in the bin. This may be a challenge for someone who is easily distracted. Organize to have a special folder and a daily routine, 
walk in, put homework in the bin. It can make all the difference. Worst case scenario, you can always get um, like a sheet protector sleeve, put the homework in that, and safety pin it to the outside of the bag so it's flapping right out there. And when they walk in, take it out, put it in the basket. Get active. Studies show that all level of children perform better on tests directly after a physical activity or recess. It is important that physical activity not be a part of discipline. For example, if a child acts up or doesn't finish their work, they don't get recess or recess is shorter. Think of physical activity as medicine needed to function better. Studies show that physical activity also improves mood for all ages. Physical activity will also help brain growth, decrease depression and anxiety. Exercise leads to better sleep. Think of motion sports like basketball, tennis, hockey, not softball or baseball where there's a lot of downtime and waiting. Also, walk the talk. It's easy for yelling and screaming to become a way of life. Modeling is the most natural way of learning, seeing and repeating. You want to model the behavior or mirror what you want to see. This means that when you get frustrated, you remain calm. Take a deep breath as needed. Also, make eye contact and be at eye level. So if the child starts acting out then, and you get very frustrated, then remain calm, take a deep breath, bend down or get on their eye level so they're seeing directly into your eyes, and then talk to them and say what it is that you're, you're wanting, the behavior that you're wanting to see. This is also an opportunity that you can teach how to respond when you're frustrated. So for you to say out loud, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm gonna take a deep breath and try and calm down. You're also teaching them how to act when they are frustrated, when they're in class or interacting with peers or friends or, um, or other siblings, then they will also learn this technique of stopping and taking a deep breath instead of acting out Keep busy. Idle time can make symptoms worse because it is unfocused. So you don't want just a few hours of free play until dinner. TV, video games, computer games, especially violent ones, are not ideal choices. You want activities like helping you to cook, playing a board game, drawing pictures, etc. Sports, art, classes, music, dancing, they're also very good activities. Logical consequences. This is the idea of giving choices instead of threats or punishments. For example, instead of saying, if you don't sit down and finish your dinner right now, you're going to bed. Instead, you can say, you can either finish eating dinner or go to bed now. Which one? In this way, you're giving the opportunity for good behavior. You always want to be ready for the either choice. Don't give choices that you aren't ready to do, like, we'll leave the store right now. And don't cave. Learning consequences is a very important lesson. Make your consequences short and immediate. Don't take something away for a week or weeks at a time. Be clear about why that consequence and how long it will last. And also, give the opportunity to earn it back if you take something away. This is especially important for teens. Directed discussion. Say what you want them to do. Say the behavior that you want to see. Show me how to walk in the house instead of no running in the house or don't run. Another example, talk softer instead of stop yelling. Another example, hold the cup steady instead of don't spill it or be careful. Be careful is vague like play nice or be good. A better way is to say take turns. Studies show that all ages, even adults, do better with what they are told. So if they're told don't drop it, don't look down, don't think of X, results in people dropping, looking down, or thinking X. It's better to say hold on to that, or keep looking ahead, or think about X, right? Set ground rules. Make it clear what the rule is. Give a warning the first time and no warnings afterwards. So if you do that one more time, then no. 
Once they know what the rule is, there's no warning because it then just becomes a freebie. If you knew that you were allowed a speeding warning the first time you were caught, every time you got in the car, and it started over every day, what would you do? Sleep. Sleep deprivation or not enough sleep can certainly have these symptoms. Um, it could be that there's a new baby in the house or sharing a bedroom with a sibling that is waking them up frequently during the night, a new location and waking up from a train outside or new noises, also going to bed too late. Kiddos need 10 to 12 hours of sleep per night. Diet, fresh foods, regular meal times, avoiding junk foods. Impulsivity and distractedness can lead to missing meals and poor diet choices. You want to have healthy snacks and have them eat them between meals so they don't have a blood sugar drop. Blood sugar drop can show the symptoms of ADD and ADHD. Consistency. Just like routine, consistency is important. Make sure the rules are understood, including what happens when they do and don't follow them. You must be consistent and follow through each and every time. Planned ignoring. This is an excellent technique. It's ignoring attention behavior and giving feedback for good behavior. So a few examples are, mommy doesn't hear whiny children or to simply walk away and ignore. Another one is, I wish Tanya was here to color with me. This is so much fun while the child is throwing tantrums. This is giving them a distraction of something that they can do and join you with and also showing that you are paying no attention to their tantrum. Teach how to handle feelings. Try not to punish feelings. Being mad, angry, frustrated, these are natural feelings. So for example, you look mad or upset or whatever. Let's take a deep breath together. This is an alternative to stay in timeout or in your room until you stop crying. Another example is, I know this is tough. Let's sit down together and calm down together. Another option is to teach distracting, so you redirect. Let's do something else. Modeling. Again, we all learn best by modeling, so getting mad at drivers on the road and starting to yell and hitting the steering wheel may not be the behavior that you want to teach talk out loud. I'm so frustrated right now. I'm going to take a deep breath and calm down. Or, I'm so mad, I'm going to take a break and do something else. This will show your child how to act and they will copy you. A cool off period. Like timeout, this is good for everyone to cool down. Praise. Give praise or rewards when rules are followed. Children with ADHD often receive and expect criticism. Look for good behavior and praise it. Sitting in front of the class. Sitting in front of the class can take away many distractions. Also, having the child sit away from friends will live, give less opportunity for distractions. Having a child with these symptoms can be very stressful on the parents and in order to function at your best, and to be healthy, there are certain things that you can do to help take care of yourself. Number one is take breaks and time off. Managing challenging behavior is exhausting. Make breaks for yourself and build them into your routine. Examples are hot baths, coffee with a friend, taking a walk, reading a few pages of a good book before bed, setting time aside maybe to watch your favorite game with friends. What unwinds you? Most people, 10 minutes of an activity, reading, prayer, a hot bath, listening to two or three of your favorite songs, provide substantially more relief and rejuvenation than hours of watching TV. Also, self-care. Self-care is all about different ways of taking care of yourself, from grooming, brushing your teeth, spending five minutes on yourself to prep, maybe that's makeup, shaving, putting lotion on dry skin. This is also nurturing yourself, like taking breaks, putting fun and free time into your daily life. When people are stressed and depressed or anxious, one of the first things to go is self-care. 20 minutes free time with kids. This is 20 minutes of play. 
Enjoy your kid in a fun activity that they do well. Maybe it's playing a game or coloring or playing with Play-Doh, characters, building something, or put music on and have a dance off in the living room. Decrease stress. Lots of books on stress decreasing are out there. You can find many in your local library as well. Eliminate the stress that you can and do activities that are relaxing. Do activities that are fun for you. Exercise. This will not only lower your stress level, but pump positive chemicals into your body and help you to be better at handling demands. 20 to 30 minutes of light exercise three times a week can be very beneficial. Organize. Make life as organized as you possibly can. Have one place for unpaid bills and a place for paid bills. Organized areas are less stressful. Get help. Reach out, friends, family, church, teachers, parent groups. You can use them for company, social support, reprieve, like schedule time away, even if it's just to go to the grocery store or take some time out. People with similar challenges and similar issues, friends or internet forums, exchange ideas and get support. Books and internet searches on parenting skills and how to decrease stress. Help organizing books, internet, friends, family, peers. They can all help you do these things or have ideas. Behavioral therapist, mental health can also help with specific goals like decreasing stress, parenting skills, finding specific techniques for your family's specific behaviors or address issues. Lastly, ask questions. If in doubt, ask questions. Go to those three different agencies mentioned in the beginning and ask specifically. He has not had his hearing checked and look for anything other than basic hearing. Can you please tell me how to do this? Or how do we know that he does not have a directional hearing problem? I live in a really old house and I don't know what type of paint is used. Can we check for lead? Or I noticed that my child doesn't seem to understand or seems to be having problems with learning. Could we check for that? Or I noticed my kid says she's bored during class and finished the task before everyone else. Could we check to see if maybe this class is too easy or too slow for her? Think about grandma passed away recently or we recently moved. What are the signs of depression or grieving for me to look for? Has individual therapy helped kids with these issues before? I hear you say that she meets ADD, ADHD criteria. But has she been tested for other things or have other things been looked at? These are the type of questions that you can present to your primary care physician, to teachers, to behavioral therapists, and ask them these things to have other areas addressed other than jumping on to ADD and ADHD. Video games. There's basically two types of games. There's education games where the whole idea is for learning. There's memory involved, matching, reading comprehension, math problems, things like this. And then there's skill games where there's lots of stimuli, lots of sound, they're fast paced, there's flashing images, there's a lot of instant gratification, meaning that you get rewarded immediately for scoring. You score something and then immediately something happens, something flashes on the screen or you get a prize. Studies have been done with these type of skill games. Kids who have ADD and ADHD have certain brainwave patterns. Kids playing video games that were skill games were monitored and found to have the same brain activity as those with ADD and ADHD. Because of this, we strongly recommend limiting the amount of skill game video game playing. Frequency, remember, you're wanting to teach delayed gratification, so engaging in instant gratification is practicing and teaching instant gratification further. In other words, with ADD and ADHD, the goal is to teach working towards something of a reward in the future. So playing a game that gives you an immediate reward is not helping your cause. So you're going to want to limit it. Consider possibly making earning game minutes a reward. And then you can build something into where 
it will take so much work in order to get the reward and the reward is only going to add up to maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day. So with TV, it's the same thing. It's all about content and frequency. Content, is it educational? Are they learning about animals? Or is it really just about entertainment? Is the family together? Or this, is this part of a social activity that you're doing as a group? Or are they doing this all alone by themselves? Frequency, you want to limit the frequency. You want to provide as much physical activity as possible. And watching TV and playing video games typically is not very much physical activity involved. You want delayed gratification, so reading is an excellent exercise. Also, hands-on activities like crafts can be good. Drawing, coloring, painting, molding clay, creating models. These things require a lot of hand coordination, and there's a lot of movement involved for them to do these activities rather than sitting very still and watching television. So what's the long-term prognosis of someone with ADD and ADHD? Some will outgrow the symptoms and they don't have them as adults, but others still do have symptoms. Either they adapt to them or they struggle with them. There are many jobs that require the employees to be able to track lots of information at once. For example, an air traffic controller must be able to pay attention to lots of different information at one time. A stockbroker must track several television screens with information at the same time. A cook or waiter must be able to prepare many dishes simultaneously and track many different people's orders. These are fast-paced jobs, and someone who gets bored easily may find them very stimulating and enjoyable, and they'll be able to keep up the pace for a full shift, but it must be something that they are very interested in. On the other hand, Jobs that are highly repetitive, like assembly line work, may be very challenging. Adults who have ADD and ADHD may have to work harder to be organized in daily life, but they can certainly have quality relationships and have good employment and lead very fulfilling lives. The key is to find strengths and interests and pursue them, and find weaknesses and compensate for them, like making lists to remember errands if they become easily distracted. As parents, we can teach the skills that help them to be successful by helping to nurture interests and teach skills to compensate for the individual challenges that they have.